Kaczynski. I'm going to be moderating the conference today and I'm going to make you suffer a lot. Um, the conference is not death by PowerPoint. In the conference we will be thinking about three dates, 1948, 2018, and 2038. This is what we decided in preparing the conference and we're going to try and see what we can do about 2038, okay? So this morning we have a short period of time with the board and then the board will go and manage business, everyday business from 2018 and we will look after the future, the rest of us. So we're turning it upside down. The board is becoming less important and we are becoming more important. So this is the responsibility which is going to weigh on your shoulders, okay? And of course, as you know, the title, the subject matter is a very, very serious one. It's migration. But the last time we met here two years ago, we were talking about how did it happen when they all came. And this time we're going to be talking about our cities are perfectly integrated because it's 2038. We've done all the work. And the question is, how did we do it? And this is what you will have to produce. But before we go into all that, we would like to honor, we would like to remember, we would like to give a real value to memory. And so we have a, a double action. You will see something on the screen in a moment, and we will have an, a, a musical accompaniment. And I would like to ask you maybe not to make photos at that point, because we need to sort of go into another world, okay? We're going back in time. We're going around the end of the Second World War. When we were, the moderators were preparing on a web, webinar last week, I asked the moderators, does somebody not have a migrant in their past? And the answer was no, we all have migration in our blood somewhere, in our DNA. And there's not one single person between the moderators who does not have migration. Obviously, we are of one color. So this is the lady who is of a different color. She, this is an honor to be here. And we cannot do different colors. I worked with migrants a lot in France. I sometimes wished I could have another color so I could feel what they feel. But we will see all those things. So ladies and gentlemen, a little bit of concentration. And please watch and please listen, OK?
little more light, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening so profoundly. It's one of the nicest moments when we listen together. So now we're going to go into the more formal part of the conference. I'd like to invite the mayor of the city of Rostock, Roland Metling, to say a few words to us. Are you going to speak German or English today? Okay. So Alexandra is very happy not to have to translate. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> After this wonderful words, it's very heavy to speak and to mention that also I have in my family, of course, the background of immigration. Tell also, us, tell us the story. Oh, my a little bit of it. A little bit. Tiny it's bit. it's only a little bit. My mother, she lived in the Polish uh, area in the beginning of the Second World War and she told about very terrible inputs in the September days of 1939. The terrible uh, time the ha she has had with her family, with her brothers at that time and the very hard situation five years after in 1945 when she had to leave with the whole family or with the rest of the family, with the rest of the family in, in the German direction. And I will never forget my mother. She was afraid to visit Poland um, for a long time and only in, in the year 2000 I took her and took her back to, to her roots in, in Poland and she told about this time. But I can tell you my mother, she was a teacher and she has done everything to bring people together and to say everybody in her school class, uh, you are one single part of a common world and we are in responsibility to live in such a common world. And that's for me the most impressive thing that my parents, uh, they, they educated others and, and me that we are living in a common world and that everybody should have the same conditions and everybody should be a friend to each other. Yes. <coughs> Normally I wanted to say we are still under the impression of the yesterday's wonderful concert and I think it was a wonderful example for integration that we could hear on the stage in the Baroque Saal the second time in, in this circle and I'm very thankful that UBC has made this suggestion in October 2015 during the conference in, in Gdynia when we had the very hard situation for, for, for Europe and still we have the situation that Europe uh, is uh, in, in a changing process. Um, only Rostock we have had in September, October more than 40,000 refugees in, in our city on their way to Denmark, uh, to, to Sweden, to Finland and, and to Norway. And about 2,000 of these refugees, they are part of our Rostock society today and we are happy that we are working on a common future for all of us. Uh, in, in our papers, uh, we, we say, it's a dream, the European dream. Let's share the European dream. This dream we can only share if everybody accept that everybody who is came to Germany uh, will be a part of our common world and uh, we should ex ex <coughs> accept that. When we have had this wonderful concert yesterday evening with musicians from Egypt, Syria, Japan, Poland, Romania, Brazil, Spain, Germany, 
At the same time, on the streets of Rostock, you saw it in the newspaper uh, today, the, the right-wing party, AfD, has organized a demonstration in, in, in Rostock, and um, some hundred people were following uh, these people, and it was a luck that more on the other side were standing of the Rostock society, and at least, um, I think we should not say somebody could win, but we could show, Rostock people could show at that time, we are a city of, of understanding and of cooperation, and uh, we are a city where we have no foreigners, we have only Rostock people, and uh, th that's why we, we are working for that. What should I say at, at, at least? Uh, I mentioned yesterday uh, Jürgen's sentence, where it is. <coughs> feel free to steal good ideas, and I added feel free to enjoy the, the riches and diversity of world music. We will talk about possibilities for integration and the experiences we have found within the last two years, but also, and uh, Marie-Louise, we spoke about that yesterday, feel free to come closer to the real reasons for refugees or for our divided world in these days. We have a big responsibility and we have to tell our people the solutions must be global solutions for the future. And nowhere in the world are real enemies. Everybody is a part of us and we can not develop anything in our country against somebody. We can only develop this world as a common world to give everybody, to give everybody a chance to be a part of this common, of this our world. Let's do our best with this conference. Welcome to Rostock again. I'm so happy that we are could follow the route we started two years ago. And thank you especially to Pia Anders. UBC is a great part of this needed development for our world. Thank you. So I'd very much like to thank our singer who gave us the intonation of the photographs. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for your emotion about your mother. I have a similar one from another side. This is why I'm so pleased that we can meet here. I'd like to invi invite the president of the UBC, Per Anderson, to say a few words. Thank you, good friends, and thank you, Rostock, for uh, hosting once again this uh, very important conference. I remember, Roland, when I called you uh, from uh, Gdynia, and um, uh, we knew it was a tough time for you and, and for the, 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 the city of Rostock and for, for, for the German uh, Republic, as a matter of fact, because it was a challenge at that time. And uh, I was very happy that you were so open and said, well, it might be a good idea, let's go on with it. And it has been a good idea. It was two years ago, it was uh, yesterday, fantastic to see and to listen to the music of so many different uh, nations, and therefore you can say in German, Musik kennt keine Grenzen. Und das ist, so ist es. Music knows no borders. I had a problem, I was happy that you uh, said that we should thank the singer because it was so fantastic that it would have been wrong to applaud just after your singing. So we had to wait and thank you, and we have done so. Thanks a lot. You asked Roland uh, about his uh, future. I'm, I'm, I should like to tell you that I'm not sure that I have uh, this uh, story to tell you, but I can tell you that, that Denmark has a story to tell you because the, one of the oldest Danish girls we know was found outside, uh, 30 kilometers outside my city. And we always thought she was uh, the Nordic type. She was one of the Vikings, a lady Viking. And then the DNA test showed that she was maybe uh, some sort of princess from uh, 
the Black Forest in Germany. So migration has been uh, all over to all times. And uh, I could say that uh, in my city, uh, we have been the, the, the most southern border city in the kingdom of Denmark because south of us, it was the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein. And thinking about that also gives one the thought that next year, no, sorry, this year in November will be the uh, 100 years anniversary of the ending of the First World War, the Great War it's called. I don't know why they call it a war a great, but it, it is called the Great War. And uh, outside my city, the neighboring city, we have in Fredericia, we have had the refugees from the uh, Huguenots in France. They came, they were uh, hosted by the Danish king. And southern, uh, to the south of us, in the uh, Duchy of Schleswig, we have the uh, um, Moravian society having their, their city. We have the Dutch uh, farmers in Amarga, just outside Copenhagen, because the king wanted fresh uh, fruit and vegetables. So he let them come to Amarga to, to, uh, to grow their, 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 their fruit. And we had quite a lot of German uh, working uh, people going up on the heathers of, of Jutland uh, to grow the heather. And, and they, they brought, as a matter of fact, the potato, and they were, therefore we call them to potato Germans but in Denmark. But that shows us that through history, Denmark has been, you could say, uh, some sort of, uh, well, transit country for, for people coming and going because also Danes have spread around. And that, I think, it's strange that after the longest period in our in, uh, recent history, as a matter of fact, after the Second World War, we have had a peaceful time for now more than 60 years. And it, it's, not a, a, it's, it's a very short time historically seen but it's my generation. I should like it to stay that way for my, my children and my grandchildren. I think we all need to, to work for the peaceful times to, to, to go on. And that's what you said, Roland. We have an obligation. Uh, we have this obligation also uh, to be open to people that have needs because of, uh, well, maybe war or maybe uh, hunger or maybe what else elsewhere in the world because the world is is so small as a matter of fact uh, that today we cannot just sit back and say well it's not my problem it is our problem because it's a humanity question it is our human problem so therefore it's very important that we can consider uh, can uh, continue considering what to be done in our part of the world which is the richer part of the world, as a matter of fact. Never forget that as well. So therefore, thank you very much uh, for, for hosting us. Once again, thank you for hosting us. And I can tell you, Piotr, and you talked to me yesterday saying, well, it might be that we cannot just present you with some, uh, well, now we have solved the problem uh, paper uh, on Wednesday. But the way we're working in the UBC is not that the uh, board shall sit down and make the policy. We are, you could say, some sort of, uh, well, we are a board because you must have a board in, a, in, in an international organization. But we use the members to create the policy. We use the commissions to create the policy. They are the policy makers. And we also use uh, a conference like this to make the policy and to come up with the good examples, to come up with the new ideas that we can consider afterwards in the board. And then we have the obligation to go on to our nations saying, we have a good idea for you, Sweden, in Denmark, in Latvia, in wherever. And we can also go through to Europe where we also are members, we are also citizens in Europe. And thereby we can say, here we have a very good we have some very good ideas to all of you in Europe how to share the European dream. That is what is going to happen. That is where we are going, you could say, offer for free for all other uh, decision makers 
all over Europe, wherever we meet them. So have a very nice conference. I shall look forward not to the result, but to the good ideas and also crazy ideas and whatever. And I certainly would like to know how I'm going to live in 38. So two words which come to mind, dreaming, okay? We're in a conference where we're being asked to dream. This is very hard work. It's going to be fun. We're going to laugh a lot. And then the second one is um, we want to be inspired. We want to take something home. This is something very, very important. What are we going to take home? And I would ask, like to ask Bernard Hemingway, who's Deputy Secretary of the CBSS, to come and say a word. You were here last time. Thank you for being so much with us. And let's see what you have to say. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very um, pleased and honored to be here second time in a row. So if we do it a third time, it becomes a tradition. And um, I very much hope for that um, because it is, a, it is a very good tradition. But let me thank you both, um, uh, Pear and, and Ronald, for, for the kind invitation and for bringing us here um, together because I think it is very important. As you said, in 2015, we had a big challenge. In 2016, we talked about it the first time as a sort of brainstorming, and I think it is important um, to bring these things together. Um, as we are sharing our migratory stories, um, I have a happy migratory story to share because I'm a migrant myself because I left um, Germany in 1994 to work for the European Commission. Um, some might say this is not a happy story, working for the European Commission. <laughs> Um, but for me, it was. And um, I was very happy to work with the subject of migration because um, I worked for um, the external relations at a time when there were the uh, Balkan wars. And I dealt with the migratory flows from the Balkans to the European Union, which was a similar size of, of uh, what we have nowadays. And then later on, I worked for the UN Migrant um, Agency, uh, IOM, and um, that gave me a more of a, of a global view. And um, I worked with uh, refugees from, from Somalia, but I also worked with um, labor migrants um, coming from North Africa to Europe. And I think it is a wide, wide range of, of issues that you, that you cover. Um, I also would like to make some, some reference to the culture that we have. And I think it is good to combine migration and, and, and culture because it is very important. I wish we had a president like you who could sing like you, but, and I have to talk to Margot Wallström about it when she uh, will open the um, council ministers meeting in, in June, that the uh, kind of expectations are very high after your performance yesterday <laughs> evening. Um, but also the, the orchestra was, was um, spectacular. Um, well, let me, let me make three very, very brief um, points on, on the substance. I think um, the importance of what we're seeing here is really that local actors play the important role in the functioning of a migratory system in any given country and any given society. So from that point, this sharing of, of best practices and that dreaming together of wh where to go and to share the dreams, which might be quite different from country to country, is very, very important. It is also very important to kind of keep migration high on the agenda because it might kind of settle down a little bit once um, the, the pressure of, of the migratory flows from 2015 gets up. And I'm, I'm very happy also to have um, uh, Bodo Bar here with me, the um, Secretary General of the Baltic Sea Parliamentary Conference, because they are also starting, like the CBSS, to look into migratory issues. But I think the important work is done here. And then my third and, and last point on that one is um, that we should also look into the demographic factor of our societies. And we're all happy to get old. I'm especially happy to get very old. And um, I want to kind of live through my pension. But, you know, we have an aging society, which um, brings us to that we need workforce from somewhere because we are not having enough here in our societies. So it is a very, very complex system, the whole migratory issue. And again, I'm happy for that um, we're here. So let me conclude by saying that, you know, we have to work on it on global, regional, sub-regional, but especially on the, on the, uh, on the um, local level. 
And given what Orland said, I think it is very important that what you could call mainstream policy occupies this area so that we don't leave it to right-wing um, politicians who kind of deal with the subject in a way that I think is not respecting human rights and is not respecting um, uh, respectful to everybody who lives in the same country. So I think if we may meet in 2020 again, um, we can come from sharing a dream to sharing reality. And that might be a good subject for the next one then. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take this occasion while we're all still here to thank very much not the mayor of Rostock, but the people we've been working with, with for Karin and for Alexandra. Thank you very much for all the work you've done, and thanks very much to the team. <laughs> and thank you very much for the team from the UBC Secretariat, because they've also been with us here. We've worked together. It's been very, very important to have both sides on, on, on the boat. Um, now I'd like to invite Hossams Abumari, who is a member of the Latvian Parliament, um, an example. Mr. Mayor, President of UBC, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very delighted to be here today with you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's my great honor to be in the great city like Rostock, eight centuries of history, celebrating the 800th year anniversary. So um, it was my special invitation for me this year to be here. I would like to start uh, a bit about uh, my story. I understand that I have 10, 15 minutes. I will try to be very quickly. So I came to Latvia in 1992, 1993 as a student, medical student, seeking for education from Lebanon. I born in 1974 in a small village in mountain of Lebanon. Lebanon is, is a beautiful country, always been Switzerland of the East. And uh, in that time, it was uh, not a big opportunity for me to study medicine in Lebanon after the Civil War. And, uh, you know, it was very expensive to get in the American University of Beirut. And it's not uh, possible to get the university, Lebanese University because there is hundreds of students seeking to be a medical student because in Lebanon and in the Arab world, usually uh, a very uh, a prestige uh, profession to be a doctor, to be an engineer, or to be an uh, advocate, for example. And that's why everybody running to be a doctor, because earning good and a prestige uh, profession. So I, 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 it was a uh, successful story when I started uh, my trip to, to Latvia in 1993, September. Uh, I get in a country uh, just after the Soviet Union occupation, a country with a lot of uh, stereotypes, um, half of the population at that time uh, minorities. Till now in Latvia we have like more than 30% uh, minorities of the, of the population of Latvia of two, of two million inhabitants. And um, it was a very big challenge for me to prove myself and to, to, to try to let the people of Latvia understand that a guy who came from different culture, from different history, from different part of the world, from the Arab world actually, he can be integrated in the Latvian society and one day he's possible to, to be a politician in the country. So uh, I believe that for any person who have a will, who has a will to integrate in any society in, in, in Europe or any, any place in the world, he has to start with language. So I believe the gate or the door to get in the society, you have to learn the language and after the language you learn the culture, you learn the history of the country and then you are in. Of course, always, uh, always uh, there are a lot of stereotypes, uh, especially uh, stereotypes for people who live under 50 years of occupation, people who live in a closed society. They never heard a lot ab about my country, about Lebanon. They never heard a lot about Arab country. They heard only so-called the thousand and one night stories, you know, when a, when a person 
uh, tried to, uh, to live uh, different lives, a lot of ladies, uh, uh, Arab countries, it's a uh, Muslim countries, so the, the ladies and the women can't work, can go out of home, uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of different stereotypes, but I had to work many years for that to change the opinion. So what I've done, so in, uh, after the 9-11, and uh, when uh, we had so-called so Islamophobia and, uh, and, and uh, so-called Arabophobia, I have uh, established an organization called Arabic Culture Center, and I decided to go for in each uh, home in Latvia. I was not waiting for the Latvian people to come to me and ask me, who are you, what are you doing here, and so on. So I believe that I, my job and my duty to enter each home in this country and say who I am, what I'm doing here, and what I want to do in Latvia. And this uh, was the first step that uh, I got in, in after four or five years, a popular uh, representative of, of many minority, because Lebanese in, in Lebanon may be 150 person, Arab in general it's like 200 person. So I tried to repre represent this big world, one person, without any politi political representation in the country, so we didn't have, till now, we didn't have any embassy from the Arab world. Last year only we had the United Arab Emirates embassy. So I was represented of this world. So I was talking in different uh, occasion. I was uh, uh, d giving my expert uh, view uh, concerning the Middle East uh, peace process, concerning all this uh, uh, spring, uh, uh, Arab springs and so on. And I was preparing each year a special um, occasion called um, something like a marriage between the uh, Lebanon and the Latvian uh, two countries. Uh, because uh, in, in Lebanon we have this 22nd of uh, November Independent Day and the Latvian is 18th of November. So I, I choose the 20s and we celebrate both Independent Day and we had a, a special uh, uh, musical uh, events. And, and, and so we were like a marriage, which I, so I, I call it like a marriage, you know, like you introduce for the second half and you try to do something to let people understand what are doing in this country. Of course, from time to time, even now as a politician, I got some uh, uh, letters like discriminating me a bit. In the beginning, 10 years ago, I was uh, feeling very bad. I was not sleeping at night. I was thinking, what I have done for these people to write me such bad things? What I have done, what I did in this country? I studied a medical student. I finished in, uh, in Latvia in 1999. And then I continue my uh, specialty in gastroenterology and I start to, st to work as a doctor. Till now I'm practicing as a gastroenterologist. So I am al already, I have like 14 years of experience as a medical doctor. I believe that, no, I don't want to, to, to choose a big uh, number, but I believe that at least 10% of the Latvian people, they visit me as a, as a doctor, you know. I feel it yeah, sometimes because I go in different places in different region in Latvia and some said, doctor, I, you know me from inside, you have endoscopy in your cabinet and so on. So, so of course, as a doctor, usually it's easier uh, when you are treating a human being, so you get closer to the person and usually they don't look at, at your uh, appearance, they don't look at your color, they don't look at your religion because they're interested to get information about themselves. So this is, was a good, actually, uh, a good uh, opportunity and a uh, good uh, mm, um, reason to get in deeper in the society. So of course, uh, I believe that for migrants, they also have a duty. So you cannot come to Germany or to Europe and just sit somewhere and ask for some support or for help, and you don't want to give something to this country. First of all, you have to get the language. Second, you have to know the history, respect the culture, and never try to push your ideology on the people of this society. Keep praying, doing whatever you want in, inside your flat. Don't push somebody else, don't push the neighbor. Respect everybody, and let's live all together in equality, you know. This is the main things that migrants have to know it. As well as, of course, the local government and the government of, of in, in EU, they have to support these people because we are all human beings, as you, as you mentioned today. We have all to give in a, uh, in a, in a peaceful uh, atmosphere and in a very good quality of life. Yesterday, it was, I was very happy when I, I, I was uh, watching uh, this international orchestra from different countries 
thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for this great concert yesterday because it was different music, Arabic music, Jewish music, German, Russian, Latvian music. So it was really, really very inspiring and giving a feeling that we are living in, in Europe, what we want, to see, what, what, what we want to, to see, that it's Europe. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a dream for, for every person living outside Europe to, to be in Europe. And let's keep this, this dream to get bigger and to become true that we are sharing the European uh, you know, tradition and the European uh, value because we are thinking of people. And it's, it's easy to be um, a human being, but it's not, to, uh, not easy to be a human sometimes, you know. Uh, so I, uh, after, uh, after, I after the establishment of the Arabic Culture Center in, in 2002, so I, I, I got very active. So I was working uh, in the, in every weekend. So I was traveling all over Latvia, so different places. I get the support from the government. I wrote a lot of projects. I get some financial support from the municipality of Riga, from the uh, that time uh, so-called the Secretariat for Integration. So I was working very actively. I was trying to meet people everywhere. And was I was keeping smiling all the time because you know there is a lack of smile of smile in Europe, especially in the country like in the Scandinavian and in the Baltic uh, state, because we have such a condition of weather that people feeling depressed and we are walking in the morning, such a such a serious face, and you can't smile, and you can't say good morning for your neighbor, you know. So I try to break all this uh, all this uh, wall between me and between the inhabitant, local inhabitant, and I was trying to say good morning in the morning for everybody, for every person, what I meet in the street, what I meet in my building. Of course, some of them, they, uh, they just answer good morning, somebody they never, they never answer till now. But, uh, but, but when, you are, when you are smiling, you just try to let people understand that you are ready for contact. When you are not smiling and you are just uh, seeing that I am living in my uh, isolated society and I don't care what happened in the country, I don't care about the politics of the country, I don't care what happened in Europe, so I just have to earn my money and just to, to, to feed myself and my family. So it's, 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 it's not enough, it's not enough if you are keeping uh, and living your life. You have to participate in a daily life in Latvia or whatever. whatever. So I want to say something very important that to, be, to, to become a, a politician in, in Latvia, I never dream about it. I never, really, seriously. So it was uh, in 2010 when uh, one of the European uh, member of parliament, he was a fo uh, foreign minister of Latvia and he was a minister of defense. He asked me in, in this marriage day in November, he asked me, you know, you are talking very well, maybe you would like to join us in our party. And that time they were uh, establishing so-called unity party. They decided all Latvian parties, small party, to go in one union and to form so-called unity. Because Latvia always, we need unity. The same like union, we all have to be together. We have to solve the problem of, of the country together. And I said, you know, if, if, if you are going to establish this unity, so I will be a part of it. If you, are gonna, if you are not going to establish, you will be divided, so I'm not going to participate in this project. And really, they in 2010, they established this party and I, I, I get in and uh, in the party, and in 2010 it was the first uh, uh, parliamentary election when I have run, but I didn't get in, but I got very interesting result actually. We have such a, a system in, in Latvia called plus and minus system. So you put minus, so you, do, you, you don't, you, 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 you want that guy not to get in if when you put minus, like you just punish him. And plus, so you give him uh, a priority to be up on the list and he can get in. And so I get like nine so, uh, no, 8,400 plus. At, the at that time in 2010, I remember that my colleague who get in the parliament, they get five, 6,000 plus. But I get 9,000 minus. But I can understand, I can understand what happened that you, when you are taking the list and you are looking, oh, Samba Bumari, who's that? You know? I'm sure in 2010 I, I, I couldn't get uh, very popular everywhere in this country and I, I couldn't treat all the Latvian people. So of course this person, Abu Mary, what? Just take it away, you know. Uh, but I, I, it was like a shock for the society, for the country in general, you know. What the hell is that guy? Who is he? What's he coming to do here in Latvia? Arabs, Muslim, whatever, you know. But I, was, I, I decided to keep working for that and then I, 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 I was working for um, four years and waiting for 2014, and I got in, in the parliament, and the result didn't change a lot. 
know? So I get like 8,600 plus and 9,000 minus, but it was a little bit different situation because I get a lot of people who they didn't touch me. Yeah, they didn't put me at minus, not plus, so they just vote for all the lists, you know? So I get in the parliament and I think I, I, I went uh, in the Latvian history for the first Arab in that region. I know that uh, we, from Lebanon, we have one uh, MP also in Sweden, but uh, in different uh, Baltic state, I don't know about Germany, but uh, I think that uh, it's, it's very important that I try to break all this, you know, solid wall, and I try to, 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 to let people understand that uh, if the person uh, respect your country, you respect your culture, you respect your history, if you learn your language, is if he is patriot, if he would like to work for the benefit of this country, if, you, if he, if he uh, related all his family and his life and he donate for, for, for Europe or for Latvia, so he's able to be a good citizenship of Europe and citizenship of Latvia. And uh, at least I would like to just uh, to, to, uh, to send a message for those people who are here today, who are seeking to become one day uh, people or citizens of Europe, you don't have to assimilate, but you have to integrate. You don't have to just cut all the roots with your country, because if you cut it once with a one country, you can cut it with the second country. So you have to keep your roots with your origin, take care of your uh, what whatever, it's fatherland, and get to Germany as a motherland. Like I say in Latvia, I have like two parents, the fatherland and motherland, so Latvia and Lebanon, you know. I'm very lucky to have both countries and to be from different cultures and to learn about two different uh, cultures because this is uh, helping me to get, uh, to, to solve the uh, intercultural conflict between uh, uh, societies usually. So keep your roots with your countries but try to be a good citizen in, 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 in the new country, try to integrate, try to res respect, not try, you have to respect all the uh, laws and all the, the culture of the country where you live and be a good citizenship because Europe is for everybody, especially for people who love Europe, of course, because we always have a bad examples, bad examples everywhere. So we cannot say that because of one bad guy somewhere, so all the city or all the country are bad because of him. You know, so that, that's why this is the difference. So please, dream becomes true. Everything is possible in life. Everything, if the person is seeking for that, working for that, doing his best for that. I'm very proud to be Lebanese, but I am much more proud to be Latvian. I'm very proud to be a citizen of Europe. I will do all my best. I will donate my life, as I always say in Latvia. Usually, blood color is like dark red, and the Latvian flag is also, you know, dark red. So, 25 years drinking from the uh, uh, da uh, Daugava River in the city of Riga, so I became, you know, Latvian in blood, and I will do my best to, to serve Latvia and to serve Europe. So, let's keep dreaming and let's share the European dream. Thank you very much for your attention. Forget. Yeah, I forget, I forget. Alexandra is from, from here. So I, I had my first book this year, actually, and this is, and you see how I'm smiling, you know? <laughs> yeah, and this, uh, this book was, uh, it's really example of integration, so it's my life, from the 1993 till, the 1990, uh, till 2017, yeah. last year. So I would like uh, to say thank you, Alexandra, also for preparation, for helping, and so on. And because you are you are speaking in Latvian, and so you can just read and inform later the mayor the mayor of about me much more. So thank you very much. Um, don't we wish we, we could all have members of parliament like that, real human beings? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move from 1948 to about now, and we're going to try and um, feel a little bit more what this um, migrant movement was two years ago, three years ago, okay? So can I invite you up here, Saif, please? Um, and we're going to um, show you a very, very, very short film. Um, 
and um, then a few questions. This? To, to be here today and thank you, special thanks for the invitation. So I don't like, I don't have any experience here, like much than I will talk about my trip from Iraq to Finland. First, uh, sometimes you, you just keep everything behind you, your family, your work, your friends, to go another country, you don't talk, you don't talk their language, you don't know the weather, you don't know the culture there. So it was really difficult first day when I want to try to leave Iraq, like I will say goodbye for my family. And I, I work as a lawyer in Iraq for three years and I must close my office. I was uh, working with another guy so it was really bad emotion, like it's really sad that I will leave my family there. In the morning of in September, t uh, it was in 11, September 2015. At morning it was really sad because I will leave my family and I can't, uh, I don't know, I will see them again. It's really difficult. Until today, I can't see them, even my mom, my, my father or my, my sisters, my brother also. So in 2015, I decided to leave Iraq because the situation in Iraq is really difficult and it's not safety for all. Like some people, they try to be there because they, they don't have any choice. They like to leave or to stay. That is really difficult for some people to leave Iraq. But some people, they try to, to save uh, their lives because if you lost your life, so you don't have anything more. So I left Iraq in 2015 and 11 September. I left to Turkey. Then from Turkey, it was like the first step to Greece by a port from the uh, uh, city of, I don't know what, what, uh, what's the name, but it was land in the, the sea. We left with a boat with the man, he said you will be like 10 to 15 but it was really 24. Too much people in a small place, or port, let's say. We left at 11 o'clock. We are on the other side at 12 o'clock in the Greece. <coughs> and it was really, af we are afraid in that time. I, I can't swim. And I said, if the guy, he wants me to be safe, so he will help me to go there on that side. It was really bad because there's the streets from Syria, from also from Iraq, but almost we are from Iraq and Syria. Uh, girls and women and also it was really there was one old man. He was like, he can't even walk, how can he can swim. But the God, he, he helped us really. He was the hand of the God, it was with us in that time. When we went to the Greece, it's, it's that the first moment of the uh, community of the Europe country. We heard in TV or when my father he was talking about Europe countries, he was here before like 
like struggling before, like in Iraq is wa when it was like there is no war, like everything is okay. So he, he was struggling here. He take uh, he said if you to 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 know that you are human, so go to Europe. You will see everything there. Good life, respect, and safe life. It was really good. And I saw everything from the people who, and from the way from Greece and to Finland, the people who don't care about your age or your background or your color. They just help you because they see you want help. You actually, it was really good. They don't ask you, what's your name? What's your origin? They don't care. They care just if you ask, I want help. Even you don't ask, they'll help you. They care about you. It was really 10 days, good experience to know the people, to know many countries like Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Estonia, uh, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. It was a long trip, but we, it was really good experience at, to know everything in these countries. And uh, my beginning is starting in Finland. In the day when I went to left Iraq, the president, prime minister of Finland, he said, it was in TV, like a program. And he said, for refugees, my home is open. And that time I said, I decided to go to Finland. And uh, in that time I didn't recognize which country I would choose. First time I said, maybe I would go to France or Germany or Sweden. But in that time I said, let's go to Finland. It was really good to be there. Even it's cold there. You know, in Iraq is like, the weather is not like there. Maybe North in Iraq is really good, but not, cold as in Finland. But even it's cold in winter, but it's really amazing in, in summer as in many countries in Europe. The people there also, the first day when I was in the border, Sweden and Finland, in the north of Finland, uh, the first day it was the police there and they say we'll come for us really. It was really amazing. As a lawyer, I am, I am working in Iraq, the police there are really not as I, what I saw here in Finland or all or, 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 or your uh, Arab country, uh, Europe countries. And uh, in that time start, we, we went to the camp, many Iraqis, many Afghanistan uh, people, also Syria, some Somalian people. It was really a hard time because it is still that we have the emotion about we left our family. We don't know about them also. Like my family they now, uh, they was in, in Baghdad, but now they live in, in Babylon because Babylon more safe than Baghdad. Even they are safe, but in Iraq, I don't believe someone is, is safe because car bombs or the militias or it's happened or like, it's like a virus, really. Even the government or the the community help Iraq to, to out from the terrorists, but they can't because like, it's like a cancer everywhere. <coughs> Not just in Iraq now, maybe in also Syria or Libya or some other countries. All of it, it's happened because the politics of, I, I can't say it because America, they, they, they do that because I don't know what the reason. So let's keep that away. And I start in Finland now, uh, I, I get the permission to stay in Finland. It was really amazing uh, day. It was in birthday, in my, be my birthday, the lawyer he called me said, you get the permission to stay in Finland. It was really amazing day. It's like a gift from the God or from the community of, of Finland. They give you that special gift to stay in Finland. Now everything is okay. Uh, I start to speak, uh, to uh, learn language, Finnish language, even if it's difficult. But if you want to live, like uh, my friend, he said the door of the community is the language also. Because I was also in Moldova before I came to Finland. I speak Romanian language there. It was really the, the door of the community is the language. It's really difficult language, but we must do it. If you want to live in this country or any country, you must talk the language. And the, this program start to sharing our dream. It's, it's really the big dream for everyone in this 
war is to come into a new world country. To see their freedom, to see their peace, to be safe, and to get good, like good family or good, good life here. I thank you for everything, and I pleasure to be here in this interview or in, in this meeting. Thank you so much. Please notice that the interview was um, a very good speech and not an interview, so I did not uh, manage to participate. Thank you very much. Um, it's a bit difficult to go on, really. Um, I think we have a lot of emotion. So a few technical things. Uh, what you see at the bottom here, um, this is the Instagram thing that you can use. Um, there, is a, there is people who are wanting us to communicate about the conference on your phones, so as many people that we can in our networks find out that the conference is happening. Um, we are streaming the conference, so this is the address of the streaming. If you want to send it to somebody, then that would be great because then maybe they will watch part of the conference today or later, I don't know. Um, I would just like to yeah, have a photograph. Um, um, I can't leave it there for very, very long, but um, it would be good if we could communicate outside on, on the today's conference. Um, just to recapitulate what our very, very high level speakers have been saying, um, what are our aims here? It's to create this really, truly integrated societies. It's to go back home on Wednesday or Thursday with a creative vision and maybe with an idea or two that we have never thought about before that we could actually put into practice in our cities. And then obviously we have a more global idea that we have to strengthen the creativity and the capacity of the UBC. It does not mean it is not strong and not creative, but we have to make it even stronger in this area because the challenge is so enormous. So this is approximately what we're going to try to do. I hope that's okay with you. Um, I'd like to now introduce a little bit about the method, but before we get to the method, a few general comments. There's a French philosopher who's called Patrick Vivray, who says that it's from, from, from the analysis of words, and we're going to be talking a lot about words, competition and cooperation have the same root. But in practice today, competition and cooperation are opposite to one another. So this is a very spectacular change in language where we've moved from something which was close hundreds and thousands of years ago to something which is very, very different. The second idea is shoulders. We've already talked about shoulders once today. On whose shoulders does integration rest? Is it them who have to get used to us or is it us that have to get used to them? And how does this work? It's almost like dancing. We have to have two people to dance the tango. So how does it work? And does the welcoming community have to make an effort? Does the migrant have to make an effort? We've heard language, culture, acceptance, tolerance. But what about the society to which they come? What do we have to do? And I have a philosophical question, which is not only a technical question. If I'm black, blue, or green, I come from somewhere else, when do I stop being from the category of a migrant? When do I just become a Latvian, a German, a Pole, or a French? Okay? Um, because sometimes with white skin, it's easy. We can hide in the mass. But if we have a different color of skin, it sticks to us. So we have to decide when do we stop being a migrant and we are just an ordinary person. Um, and it's a question of perspective. Um, does somebody know what this is? I'm sorry? Yes. Nelson Mandela. Please look. From this point of view, you just see 50 sticks in the ground. From this point of view, you see something which is logical. It's Nelson Mandela. Okay? And we have this in a place which is a very interesting place. It's the place where he was arrested 50 years ago. Um, and it's simply a way to celebrate um, this man. We like him, we don't like him. He has his greatness. 
And it shows us that the perspective from which we look is so important. So do we, as, as our member of parliament said, are we seen be because we are an Arab, a Muslim, with everything that we know behind those words? Or are we seeing a doctor, a parliamentarian, a skillful man, a good speaker? What is it that we see? It's, I was for 30 years in France, and um, we drink wine in France, and so we put the wine into the glass, and it's half full. Now, is it half full, or is it half empty? What do we see? If it's very good wine, then it's half full. If it's very bad wine, maybe we think it's half empty. I don't know. Anyway, um, I've been working a lot recently on how do we know if we're conducting a good policy? And I've been working with the UNDP on the SDGs, this, these 17 aims that the United Nations has put forward. And we're going, I'm going to talk for two minutes about what we call a management journey. So basically we have one to six, which as you can see are very standard elements of how we actually get to something. We identify goals. We talk about what sort of change model are we going to do. We set up the project, we analyze and we disclose it. But ladies and gentlemen, we have different pathways for making this journey, don't we? It's not just one simple straight line. And so we have to think about, as, as the parliamentarian said, we have to think about different things in order to see whether what we are going to do in the migration question is right, is better, is wronger, etc. And it depends on perspective, it depends on the context, it depends on the reason we, why we want to assess what we've done. It depends on the level of rigor. Sometimes a little bit of rigor is sufficient. Sometimes we have to have a publication done by three universities and two professors because that's what the situation requires. But do we need that every time and can we afford it? So this impact measurement, which has become the impact journey, has a whole series of levels where we can actually, it's sufficient to hear the story. Today we've had two excellent storytellers just witness to what they've lived through, okay? For the impact of on their lives, I think we know tons on what they've actually lived through. Do we need to know more? Do we need to dissect them, you know? I'm not sure. So this is, I think, a very interesting way of looking at discrete pathways for making the, the impact journey. And this means that some people will say, I'm an agnostic, I don't care whether my policy has an impact. And at the other end, on A, we will have, we have to have the positive and the negative effects, the unintended and the intended. We do something much more complicated. Why am I going into this just for these two minutes? Because we've done so much work on, do I know that the policy I've decided is a good one? Is it having the effects that I thought it was going to have? So some kind of measurement of what we do in the migration question I think would be very, very good. And this is just a little touch on a much deeper question, which at the moment on the planetary level with the UNDP and others, they are trying to find a way of making it a common journey and not just a journey for specialists, which is why I allowed myself to talk about it. So ladies and gentlemen, after that little bit of theory, we have these three dates that the group of who worked very hard, and thank you for them, on to prepare this conference, we decided that we were not just going to do 2018 in the future, but we had to go back. Why do we have to go back to the war and to what happened after the war? Because most of us in this room have something to do with those changes. Um, if you have a, 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 some, a grandfather or grandmother or parents who had to migrate, could you put your hands in the air, please? A little higher so we can see them. That's about a half of the room, okay, has a migrant story to tell. So half of us, but most of us think we are from where we are. So we are migrants, we are the children of migrants, the grandchildren of migrants. So today, if we were sitting into 1948 and we were saying, what is it going to be like in 70 years time? I don't think we could imagine this world that we have today. But the exercise that we're going to try and do today is we're going to try and travel into 2038 on the migrant question. You've all signed up for a group. 
I'm going to be leading the group on religion, on how we see religion in 2038, and on how we think that we can live together with our religions. Is it just a private question? Does the local authority need to build something where people can gather in another religion? Or can we share the building which is already there? I don't know what the questions are. You will tell me what the questions are, because I will not be the expert. I just agreed to moderate. And there are seven other people in this room. Could we have the moderators showing their hands, please? The moderators. Those people have said, we are ready to moderate a group working today. And so we have all these different subjects, and you've signed up for that. You know exactly what it is. And this is what we are going to try to do. Now, before we go into the method, I would like to do a little exercise with you. A little relaxation. Is that possible? Will you follow me? Uh, you have to put your paper down. And you have to sit down very comfortably. Good. Now, you put your paper down. And if you touch me, don't pull up.
little bit of an illusion for our skeptical friend, but something which is to do with a dream. There is a Swiss, a Swiss colleague of mine called Professor Mario Wright. He talks about dreaming in these seven different ways. Um, the moderators have this, so it's not a problem for you to see it. But basically, a dream is something to do with one of them. The core, what we actually work on, in the bus coming from Berlin, we were there with two ladies from Finland who worked with young people. So that's my domain. which I know so well, is there something which I'm missing? I don't know them, so you have to learn it. This is something which is a dream. Analogy or metaphor is also another way in which the professor explains something which is on the borderline of information. In the Bible, in the holy books, we often have parables. We talk about something else to symbolize the reality. We have to use this type of poetry, this type of creativity. There's another element he talks about. Is you, remember, you know the moment when you wake up and your head is spinning and going around and thinking about all sorts of different things without really any control. This can be very creative. And he says this is often linked to a time space of about three to five years where we can actually say, oh, I, I've identified one of the white spots and I know what I want to do or what I can try to do. And then we have the fifth one, which is sometimes is, is written like a miracle ideas that fall from heaven. You know, it strikes you. We have this phrase in English, that it, I, I was struck by an idea, like I was hit by an idea. So it comes from somewhere. It comes from our minds, it comes from interreactions, etc., etc. And apparently that's the more the Steve Jobs thing, you know, that his sort, of, his sort of instrument was his inspiration years before he actually managed to realize what it was going to look like and what it was, how it was going to function, okay? And then we have this sixth one, which is a lesson for me every time I have to explain it. Sometimes I'm called an expert. And when we dream, the most dangerous people are experts because they bring us back to reality. So we are very dangerous when we are talking about innovation and creativity because we know, don't we? But I hope I'm not of that type. And then we have the last form, which is infinity, fiction. You know that we flew before we knew how to because somebody wrote it. Leonardo da Vinci, science fiction. We've traveled to all the planets in the planetary system before we even knew that we could go to the moon. So there are no limits to our creativity, ladies and gentlemen. And I wanted to show you from that level of creativity to the reality what it is that we have to do. And this concerns what our doctor friend was saying. This is a young lady from a, a Muslim country 20 years ago when I did an interview in France, what shocked me was the medical visit. That hurt me. They make you go into a small space. I was with my burqa, and there was the weight of my religious beliefs. I had to undress. I had my tights on. Take them off, the doctor said. Why, I answered. I lay down on the table. He looked at me just like that and said, okay. So her conclusion is, so he made me get undressed to look at my body. It was very difficult. It was as if you are marked like cattle, as okay coming from another country, but now you can be here. It's not me, it's a young lady who said this, who was marked by the way in which Europe treated her. This Europe that both our friends from Iraq and from, Le from Lebanon have said is this freedom-loving, nice place. This is France. Nobody here represents France, so that's fine. It's in another country, but maybe it represents a certain form of reality. So between the dream, we have this type of reality, and we're going to create the perfect citizenship type of city um, because we're going to do a method called appreciative inquiry. It's not something which I invented. It's something which I use and adapt. As you can see here, it's used by many people, quite well known, and I would like to go into the five principles so that we talk a little bit about the theory. It's to do a lot with words. Words create worlds. So we are a type of animal which through words can create some kind of reality. 
And very often we complain. We say, oh, the far right is going to say this, that, and the other. But yesterday in the concert, we were in a world which was a positive world, which we've created, because the mayor says, let's listen to the music, let's get some musicians together, and they can be expat musicians. That's the creation of a positive world. This leads to a positive change. Do you remember the energy of that music yesterday? The simultaneous principle. If we're actually looking into a question, especially when somebody thinks about it, it happens that something, there's a snowball effect. We analyze and we try to deal with it. This is what I'm going to be asking you to do today. But let's not forget poetry. Something about words meaning much more than just their initial meaning. So storytelling, we have some fantastic examples this morning. This takes us into another world. We've been to Iraq, we've been to the, the, the Latvia of, of our Lebanese friend. We've been there this morning, if we were really listening. So the anticipating principle, this is one of the most important. It says we can have a vision of the future, so this well-being in Europe, and that inspires us into action. It brings us closer to the action. The people who constructed this method say, if you manage to explicit the idea, you are moving towards the realization of the idea. It's not thinking about the rules, the regulations, the lack of money, the lack of decision making, five decisions before you can actually do something. No, 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 ladies and gentlemen. You are all responsible for your ideas and there is no hierarchy on you today. No, nothing is leaning on you. No boss is going to say you can't do that or I haven't got the time to decide. We have the whole day to produce the new reality, being totally free, every political decision we have, you have, uh, you, that you need, you will get it. I guarantee it. Today and tomorrow. Afterwards, that's different. Okay, two days of my decision making. So you have all the political decisions, and you have unlimited money. What will you do to do to satisfy the principle of success? In other words, that something works because we don't often talk in positive terms like this. We spend more time analyzing why in public procurement cannot we do something like this or like that. Very different. And this is possible, ladies and gentlemen, because you have unique gifts, you have talents. Something which is very fashionable at the moment is to ask somebody who is a politician, tell us what you do in your private life. And the last one I, I heard talking about this was somebody who writes science fiction books, but nobody knows that it's the same guy. And he suddenly comes out and he says, I, write this, I wrote these books, there's five of them, you've read them. Oh, shock. We all have abilities, we have ideas to implement, don't we? We have organizations, we have very complicated organizations, very efficient ones. We have an unlimited ability in building relationships. Look at the UBC. It started one day and today it's completely different. And in 2038, maybe there will be another president, not quite the same one, I don't know. So the visions of the future are created when they are articulated. We have to say them. We have to say in order to believe. Then to believe, we go into reality. And so this guides us into individual actions and joint actions. I'm sorry if I'm speaking so long about this, but often we see the problem, the difficulty. And I'm just trying to tell you, you are an extremely talented group of people you knew what was going to be in the program a little bit. You know we're going to go crazy for two days. That's lovely. Thank you very much for the confidence. And we're going to go further. Appreciative, what does it mean? It's all about recognition, added value, gratitude. So it's the recognition of the best in people. It's noticing the elements which are positive, that give life, health, energy. Recently, we were talking in Strasbourg with some people, and we had the example of a young gentleman who was uh, uh, responsible for communication. And he, in fact, he explained to us that his job was transmitting energy to people. And I said, why in local authorities do we not have managers of energy? But I'm not talking about electricity. I'm talking about human beings, okay? Increasing the value, making, making it more investment type of spending. Our actions in the domain of integration should be an investment in the future. I know it's almost impossible in local authorities to change the type of budgets and talk about soft projects as being an investment. 
but we should treat them like a building. It's there for a long time, isn't it? And so this inquiry, what does it mean? It's exploration and discovery. You've been brave to come to this conference because it's a risky conference. And the, mo the moderators just said yesterday, mm -hmm, is it going to work? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to ask questions. We're going to research. We're going to search. We're going to explore. To explore means to go somewhere we've never been and see how it is. So we're going to try and come out, out of our boxes and we're going to go somewhere else. And we're going to try and investigate how does it work. So the spirit of inquiry is learning. And these are the four basic steps that we're going to be following over the next day. We're going to try and discover what it is that we're going to be talking about. So with the moderators, they will help you to talk about the subject, which is the subject of your workshop, the general subject. You have to go relatively quickly. Please remember that we don't have the time to talk about everything. We have to talk about the essential elements. We have the dream. So what is this situation in 2038? I'll be talking about this a little, bit, a little more, but the important thing is that we transpose ourselves into 2038. I have to speak in the present tense. Do you remember there was this meeting in 2018 in Rostock? My goodness, it was so long ago. But today we are in 2038. And then we design and we have the destiny. We have to see how we actually create this future. So what will we do? There will be a moment in the groups where you'll get to know each other. Then there is a questionnaire, which is in your program. In this, in this, in this program, there is five or six questions that you will be asked to answer on the second to last page. This is an individual work. It's very demanding because it asks you real questions. Don't be frightened. That you take this home. I'm not a teacher, and the moderators are not teachers. We will not get a good or a bad mark. You will simply have to think a little bit. So it will be this pleasure of answering these questions in silence in the room where you will be. I love moments when people are silent together. Then we will work on something which resembles a SWOT exercise. Strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. It's also in your little booklet, but it will be done together on the flip chart. And you will try and and get into the reality of what you're trying to do. You will see the moderators will help you in this aspect. Then we will probably manage to have a break at lunchtime because that's an hour and a half and we're really over running over time. And you will have the two other parts of the method, which are the, the collective dream and the destiny. Please remember that tomorrow morning here, you will be the mayor, somebody else will be the parliamentarian, somebody else will be the director of I don't know what institution. You don't have to play the roles that you do today. You can be somebody different. It will depend on what you feel. What is it necessary? I did this one day in Poland, and the director of the social, the social care center, she became the prime minister. No problem. Um, because the prime minister had to take the decision that we needed so that it could come about. Okay? So if we don't have the right people today, then you take these different positions. It doesn't matter. You can see. Um, we can become parliamentarians or politicians if we want to, okay? So there's no problem from that. We have no limits, ladies and gentlemen. Our limits are the limits of our imagination. Is that r does that sound right to you? Is that okay? Yes? Good. Thank you very much. So I think that's enough for now. Um, all, the, all the moderators have more material in the PowerPoint, but I think that's, that's super enough. And I would like us to think about, it's 11.28, so we're running about, um, about half an hour late. So I will stop there. Um, if in a group you should think that maybe we need Piot to come in and say a few words, then please say so um, to the moderators. They have my telephone number, and I will come, but I'm moderating the group which is here. In the program, on this page, we have the room numbers of where each group is and basically apart from the group on safety and religion which stays in this room the other rooms are along the corridor on that side after the coffee so find your room the idea now would be that we take a coffee are we allowed to take the coffee into the rooms so please take your coffee serve yourselves and go into the rooms because we've lost half an hour on this very interesting introduction Thank you very much for listening. Have a really good day and have fun.
Go crazy.